Okay, folks, once again, welcome to the Critical Fitness Podcast. Today, we're talking about probably one of the best topics that you can talk about, and that is booty cheeks. We're talking about butt cheeks. I think I'm going to say butt cheeks. Um, I'm going to say over under... I'm, I might say butt cheeks over 50 times in this podcast. Uh, today we're talking about glutes. Glutes sound dumb and boring, and I don't think people search on Google for glutes as much as they search for butts and butt cheeks. I would also say, not only is saying butt cheeks a lot more fun than saying glutes, I kind of don't understand. I guess I do kind of understand. Because it wouldn't be fun to say butt cheeks if it wasn't naughty in some way. If there wasn't something kind of childish and stupid about saying booty cheeks, then it wouldn't be fun. So I guess I fully endorse that the proper way of saying it is a glutes, but I'm going to keep saying butts and butt cheeks and booty cheeks or whatever. Today we're talking about booties, butt cheeks, and why you need to have a nice, big, strong ass and why you want to have a bigger, stronger butt. Specifically, the blog that I started this with, because again, the workflow is blog, podcast, YouTube video. So of course, if you don't want to hear me ramble, there's a more succinct version of this that's like a blog um, on, on the website, Project Critical Fitness. But in the, uh, you know, the title for the, uh, <laughs> the title for the blog was uh, a thought experiment and your butt sucks. And that's basically what we're, we're going to be talking about is a big part of the motivation for this is I see a lot of people every now and then make fun of women on the internet for doing butt workouts. And look, if you want to make fun of these, you know, vapid girls for whatever reason, that's that's up to you. I, I'm not going to lie. I know a lot of people would probably be mad about me saying this. I, On a certain standpoint, I do get it. I do sort of get the whole making fun of talentless women lip syncing on TikTok being millionaires for it, I I, I kind of get it. Um, I'm not going to say I don't get it. I definitely, I think most people would prefer to see women doing cool things, dribbling soccer balls, I don't know, like playing chess, being good at shit, but for whatever reason, you know, girls rule the internet. There's a lot of, of chicks that just don't have really any talent and they are famous. And I think a lot of people are kind of angry and jealous of them and like, why are you famous? Why are you successful? You literally just got genetically lucky and you're skinny and you stand in front of a camera and that's it. But I'm not here to talk about that as much as I am to talk about specifically the category of thoughts. And again, thoughts means that hoe over there, which is kind of the dumbest acronym ever. You could just say ho or whatever. It's sort of like, it's like a tangentially offensive. I don't know how thought somehow became less offensive than just calling a woman a hoe straight out. Like it's sort of a strange thing when you think about that. If you, if I call a girl a thought, I guess if I call a girl a thought, most girls are going to be pretty upset about that. But you'll hear women full on call themselves a thought, but most women would not be down to call themselves a hoe, which is strange because hoe is in the fucking name. It's that hoe over there. I don't know how th that became better than just calling a chick a hoe, but it did f for some, some other reason, but specifically the category of the butt workout thoughts. I think you got them all wrong. I think you got these women all wrong, not in the um, personality or armchair psychiatry thing. If you want to be an armchair psychiatrist with these women, you know, I'm not going to stop you, nor probably could I, but specifically the aspect of their workout routines. And the funniest thing about this is like, you know, a lot of people like to think that the, these girls are being stupid because they just want to have bigger butts and get more likes and become millionaires or I don't know, find a, an Air Force pilot, who knows, whatever. But the reality is, if there's one group of muscles that everybody should be working out all the time, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what the, you know, even, I would say even in probably third world countries, maybe less so, everybody should be doing more butt workouts. Yeah, everybody should be having, trying to work on having bigger, stronger butt cheeks. And in this episode of Critical Fitness Podcast, I'm going to explain why. I'm going to get into the nitty-gritty of butts and butt cheeks and why you really do want to have, for very practical and longevity and health span reasons, you want to have 
better butt cheeks. You want to have bigger, stronger, more powerful butt cheeks, and you should be doing everything you are seeing those girls doing. Everything you see them doing, you should be doing. And by the end of this podcast, I hope to have convinced you uh, to change your routine and change your life, folks. Change your life. Once again, I have to remind everybody that Critical Fitness is an apparel brand. This is to serve as hopefully beneficial content for you. I want to get America moving. I want America to be healthier. And I hope to fund this content through designer clothing. They, you know, I mean, right now what I'm wearing is I'm wearing my Critical hat and I'm wearing my Critical t-shirts. A lot of people think they're really nice and clean. It's just a, just says the word Critical. Cool color combos. A lot of people like those. I've got all kinds of other designs. I've got my always moving pattern. A lot of people love that. They get they put that on and they feel like that fire inside. Like, yeah, I got to get moving. I've got uh, rash guards. I've got duffels. You know, I work really hard on these designs. And I think that if you check out my website, projectcriticalfitness.com, you are going to find something that you like. That is essentially the, really right now, the only way of supporting me. If you like this content, if you're finding benefit from it, if you found useful information, and if you want to keep funding this, there's no Patreon. I'm not begging for your money. I guess I kind of am, but I'm not, I'm not begging for just a donation. I'm trying to sell clothing, and that's how you're going to fund this project. That's how you're going to fund this information. If you get benefit from this, uh, it would really be helpful in, in the longevity of this project. And again, ultimately, you know, this is a brand that is going to become a technology company. I think that there's big things that can happen with this technology that I hope to start working on in the next couple of years. This technology will get people moving. It's going to help people move for longer in their life. I think there's a lot of different applications that the technology uh, will do. It's, it's, it's The technology is going to be essentially clothing that allows a phone or other devices to help you track your movement, almost like, um, almost like your watch or whatever, but it's covering your whole body. And yeah, I, I have a lot of different applications for this technology that, that once it's developed, I think it'll help with preventing injuries. Um, I've, I've considered like it might help with like gaining data about whether a person's having a stroke and automatically you know, calling an ambulance or anything like that for them, kind of like the Apple Watch already has, but ideally a little bit better. Uh, yeah, the, the technology, the idea I have for this technology is if it actually works, if I can get this thing to work, then it'll have wide applications. And I think it can make life better for a lot, a lot of people. But we just got to get there, folks. So if you if you like these ideas, if you like the designs, if you like the brand, if you like the information, again, there is only one way to support, and that is to go to my website, Project Critical Fitness, check out the gear and see what you like, see if there's anything that you can cop and, and sport it around. And of course, uh, the other way to support me, tell everybody, tell your friends about the podcast. If you like it, if you thought this was entertaining, tell people about it and also give me some feedback. So there's actually, funny enough, there's new features now on Anchor and Spotify. This podcast is going to eventually be everywhere. It's going to be on Apple Podcasts. It's going to be on Overcast. It's going to be on your different, but let's be honest. Apple Podcasts sucks. It's just a it's just a shitty application. This is why Spotify is trying to swoop in and save the day and just start like moving this technology forward. And literally today they announced that they're going to start adding different ways of communicating via podcast. So in other words, you can share clips if you want, but also you can then write comments on clips or or you can answer questions in clips. So check out Spotify, check out Anchor, and if you like this. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great way. And of course, I'm obviously going to be posting this on YouTube as well. So feedback, all feedback, welcome, as long as it's actually constructive and not some garbage. Leave a comment and let's, you know, let, give me some feedback and I'll see what I can do. If there's topics you want me to talk about, let me know and I'll cue that up. All right. And now back to booty cheeks. Let's get back into booty cheeks and why I love booty cheeks. But I mean, let's, let's be real. I mean, everybody loves butt cheeks. Everybody loves booty cheeks, but we're not here to talk about why people like looking at them. We're here to talk about why you need to have stronger butt cheeks for your life, for your health span and why they're important for you. Well, the biggest reason actually has to do with gravity. So the two, you know, this is, <laughs> it's funny. I have a habit of talking about stuff that start off really simple, but get really complicated almost quickly. So obviously we're talking about butt cheeks, but butt cheeks have everything to do with gravity and fighting gravity. 
that's essentially what you do all day long is you fight gravity. And what I always try to tell people is gravity is undefeated. Gravity is the undefeated champion of the universe. Gravity defeats everything. Gravity defeats light. That's what a black hole is. A black hole is when there is so much, the effects of gravity have become so compounded and so uh, concentrated that nothing can escape it. Not light and by what we can understand right now, it it can't even, time can basically not escape it in the sense that if from an outsider, it seems that time becomes infinite uh, when you are, when you're being transported into a black hole. Gravity is a compounding effect. It affects you as you get bigger, it, the effects of it compound against you. And the stress of gravity compounds over time. This is why everything crumbles. This is why the best bridges in the world will one day crumble. A tiny little crack will continue to grow. And the crack will transfer that force into a different area of a bridge or a structure. And then that crack will start to grow. And the negative compounding effect of gravity will start to accumulate. And until it almost feels like a magic trick. The effects are so slow. It's... it's the, you know, if you were to have like a bridge or whatever, the first crack might take, I don't know if it's a well-built bridge, let's say 50 to 100 years. The next crack might take like half that. The next little break in it might take half of that until you have a structure that has fully collapsed. And it, between the first fix and the last fix, it might have been 200 years. But in those last couple breaks... The brakes got closer and closer in time until you have total destruction. Hopefully you can see that this is kind of a metaphor for your body as well, right? A lot of older folks, what can happen is, is that, you know, it, you see them in their, you know, maybe late seventies and their eighties. And as they get to that, that sort of end stage, they just start to break down quicker and quicker. Every Thanksgiving, you see them, maybe they were standing up a little bit straighter. Now they're a little bit more bent over. Next Thanksgiving, you see them, they're fully bent over. Next Thanksgiving, they're in a walker. Next Thanksgiving, they're in a wheelchair. Well, why does that happen? It's the negative compounding effect working against them. And it's the same negative compounding effect that works against you. Now, we're no, nobody's going to live forever. That's not the goal of critical fitness. The goal of critical fitness is to get you to be more comfortable in your body now and to get you to be more comfortable in your body for as long as we can, right? I mean, I think people are starting to focus more about uh, health span than lifespan for good reason. Do you want to be the guy that spends the last, or woman or whoever, do you want to be the person that spends the last five years of their life on a bed? No. You want to be the person that could walk around hopefully pain-free, until the day you die. That would be the ideal situation, I think, for most people. Most people, the ideal situation is you can kick a soccer ball with your grandkids. You can kick a soccer ball with your great-grandkids. And I'll say this, it is pretty reasonable to expect that these days. I think we can already see when you look around, younger folks, millennials or whatever, I think you can already see that, yeah, we are going to be living longer. But living longer doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily be comfortable. Because again, as you, as you age, there's negative compounding effects working against you. Gravity is working against you. So what does that mean? What does it actually physically look like when I say that gravity is working against you? Well, before we get into the specifics of that, the next big concept that you kind of got to wrap your head around is that everything in life, all organic processes are a series of feedback loops, much like a computer. In fact, most likely we invented computers to model off of the way or like organic life performs these uh, simulations. The simulation being that life is trying to carry information forward, be it a virus, be it bacteria, be it eggs of a lizard, be it humans raising a child and teaching that child information and then repeating the cycle. For whatever reason, it appears that all organic processes are essentially different, different feedback loops, all trying to lead towards 
carrying information forward, genetic information, ideas. It doesn't matter. But the information is moving forwards in time. And you exist as a series of billions and billions and billions of these little feedback loops. It could be anything from it's cold, put a sweater on, to I'm hungry, I'm going to eat. But there's lots and lots of little feedback loops that occur that you do not ever think about, that you don't ever know about. And one of the big ones would be atrophy. Now, you probably have hopefully heard of atrophy. Atrophy is when basically organic tissue in your body starts to get smaller. Um, and your body is essentially consuming it via a couple different ways. If you're a bodybuilder, this is your quote unquote uh, enemy, right? Because bodybuilders are obsessed with hypertrophy. Right. So trophy meaning uh, like maintenance of a tissue, hypertrophy basically being you're trying to make that tissue even greater muscle tissue. You want you want bigger and stronger muscles. You want hyper sized muscles. You want have these huge cannonball delts and you want to be as big and strong as possible. The opposite of hi hypertrophy would obviously then be atrophy. Atrophy is that in the case of muscles that the muscles are getting smaller. Atrophy is kind of a, I think, a, a wildly mis, uh, misunderstood concept. People think that atrophy is an inherently bad concept. It is not. It is an efficiency feature. It's actually one of the reasons, I mean, again, all things in life exist because of feedback loops. Atrophy would not exist. It would have been uh, destroyed after hundreds of millions of years or so if it didn't have some type of feedback loop that involved carrying information forward, carrying your information forward, carrying your DNA forward, that type of thing. It would have been completely eliminated, but it wasn't eliminated. Instead, all organic life has some type of atrophy property, or at least all multicellular life. The reason for that is because atrophy is your body's way of streamlining. Atrophy is when your muscle eats itself to basically reallocate resources and, and stop sending resources to a part of your body that is not being used. In this case, your butt cheeks. Why do your butt cheeks suck? Why do your butt cheeks get so small? Well, let's go back to gravity. You have to fight gravity. You have to fight gravity 24-7. It is the by far the biggest stressor in your life, more than anything else, more than radiation, more than what you're consuming, more than anything, the biggest stressor, the biggest crusher in your life is gravity. It is, it is the thing that makes you old. It's the thing that stretches the fascia in your dermal layer in your face and makes wrinkles. It's physically, it's, it's your body succumbing to the stress of gravity over a prolonged period of time. And so your body, among many things, its number one priority is how do we keep fighting gravity? And that's why you have muscles. You have muscles so that you can combat gravity and you can succeed in fighting gravity in a number of different ways. If it means something targeted, like I have to run and chase an animal, your body will allocate resources to help you fight gravity in that manner. It will put muscles where you need to. It will supply nerves to those muscles. It will supply blood flow to those muscles. It will supply calories to those muscles. It will figure out what it thinks is necessary to complete that goal. Again, via a feedback loop. Okay, this is successful. Your body is doing this. So your body, so you are in this position. Your body is going, okay, uh, today, what did we do? Today we ran. So what do we need to do? We need to construct a body for running. Tomorrow we didn't run. The next day we don't run. The day after that we don't run. Okay, so maybe we don't need to build a body for running. So what do we build a body for? Well, we're sitting. We're doing a lot of sitting. So what does that mean? Well, since we're doing so much sitting on our butt cheeks, I guess that means we don't need our butt cheeks because you don't use your butt cheeks when you're sitting. You use your hip flexors, right? This is kind of a weird concept people don't realize, but you are actually using muscles when you are sitting down. It's called pa passive flexion. It kind of makes sense when you think about it. I mean, basically, if you were sitting on a couch upright watching TV and suddenly your brain turned off and you couldn't send signals to your muscles and well, basically you die, what would happen? You'd fall over. Maybe you'd fall over to the side. Maybe you'd fall over to the other side. Maybe you'd fall forward. Maybe you would slump back. But you wouldn't 
probably maintain the position that you're in unless it's like some kind of crazy lazy boy recliner and you're just really stuck in there, most likely you would fall over. Your body would succumb to gravity. Well, since you're spending time in that position, yeah, what are you, you going to do? Well, your, your hip flexors, which pick up your knees, they connect your spine to your femur, basically the upper leg bone, that giant thick leg bone uh, in, your, in your thighs, and they connect to that. There's other muscles, there's your show eyes, which connect your pelvis, those big muscles in your hips. I mean, I should say your bones in your hips, and they connect to that femur. You're going to probably use a little bit of your abs, but let's face it, the abs are they're complicated and they get misused in a bunch of different ways. And you're not going to use your butt cheeks. And you're not going to use probably your hamstrings. Your hamstrings are going to start to develop in a, in a position that you don't want them to really develop. Essentially, you're sitting in a, in a 90 degree position. And so your hamstrings, your body is going, okay, well, we're not runners. We're not power lifters. We're not swimmers. Whatever you want to call this, we're sitters. So that's the feedback loop you've created. So your body's going, okay, I, I, we're stuck in this feedback loop of I have to fight gravity in this particular manner. So what am I going to do? I'm going to start to consume the muscles in my butt cheeks. Literally, you eat your own ass. I'm not joking about that. Now, you're not obviously, you know, eating it with your mouth, but your cells are eating themselves. There's a bunch of different processes. One of them is called apoptosis, which is essentially when the cells in a, in a region, I'm not, I'm not sure if this actually happens so much for, for the muscles in your butt cheeks, but essentially there's valuable resources in there. And so it'll kill cells, it'll, it'll break up proteins, and it'll recycle them and try and use them in different parts of the body. Maybe some, some, some of it gets shit out and pissed out. But... Your body, I mean, we have to be uh, extremely efficient. All organic, we, you know, right now in this, this modern lifestyle, it doesn't feel like your body has to be optimally efficient all the time. But this body was not designed for this modern lifestyle. This body was designed to survive in the Sahara, the, the fields of the Sahara. And we were competing with other animals. And those animals were working to be, their bodies were working to be as efficient as possible. So when you're not using your butt cheeks, your butt goes, I mean, your body goes, hang on, this is valuable protein. This is valuable blood. This is valuable fatty tissue. This is valuable nerves. Why are we sending, it's like a corporation almost. It's why, why are we sending uh, valuable resources to something we're not using? So that's what it does. It cuts off the, the supply of, you know, maybe not blood, but probably like a little bit less, a little bit of less uh, nervous tissue. So uh, if you remember, I mean, I'm basically probably just going to repeat this because it's a pretty core, core concept, but I've talked more in depth about this concept, but essentially for everything you do in your body, you have nerves that, uh, it's a, called a neural pathway that connect to whatever, maybe it's, let's say it's a muscle like your butt cheeks, okay? And the more you use your muscles, specifically in a, uh, in a pattern, a movement pattern, the more that neural pathway gets reinforced. This is something that physiologically occurs. This is not a, you can see this in a microscope. This is not some woo-woo Gwyneth Paltrow idea. This is like a thing that you can zoom in on and, and you can see, okay? Your nerves become more reinforced with fatty tissue called myelin sheath. Thank God I finally said it this time. Last time, you, if you heard this podcast, you probably heard me struggle through that for some reason. It's a fatty tissue that wraps around a nerve. It is very similar to the, the insulation you see around an electrical cord. In fact, they are very similar in concept, almost eerily similar. Essentially, just like the insulation around a uh, electrical cord is there for safety, but it is also there to make the, the flow of electricity more efficient. The fatty tissue that is wrapped around a nerve has a very similar concept. And when a nerve is being continually used, your body puts more insulation around that to make it more efficient. And this is where you get to the point where you have somebody like, 
you know, athletes that they have been performing the same neural pathway. Let's say it's shooting a basketball. The same neural pathway has been used. The same movement pattern has been used enough that they have so much insulation around those nerves that they don't even really have to think about it. They're just using instinct. And this allows them to be even better athletes because they can think about strategies. They can think about whatever, but it's automatic, right? That's what the phrase, it's automatic. When you see, you know, Steffi, Steph Curry, <laughs> Steffi, when Steph Curry shoots a three-pointer and it's automatic, in many respects, that is actually true because he has primed a neural pathway so many times that it is, that this path is automatic. Vice versa, we've got you sitting on the couch with your sucky butt cheeks. And your butt cheeks are not automatic. They're probably the opposite of automatic. Why do I know that your butt cheeks probably suck so much? Well, the average adult American spends 6.5 hours a day sitting. Mind you, the average adolescent American spends 8 hours a day sitting because of school. Which is actually way worse than adult sitting. It means that in your development, in your, when you're having these huge synaptic birth, growths, like, for example, in your early uh, you know, toddler years, you're probably running around a little bit, but like when you are in puberty, when you're in 12 years old, 11 years old, 13 years old, you are having a synaptic explosion. You are developing all these different new neural pathways. It's one of the two biggest ones that you have in your life. And you are, unfortunately, most Americans have been you've been stunted, you've been ripped off because you spent those crucial years sitting on your ass. This is a huge part of the reason why people who are athletic their whole lives, basically who spend their entire lives doing sports, have a much easier time just coming back into them because albeit it's much less than eight hours a day. If those kids spend an hour or two a day running around, playing soccer, playing football, playing basketball, they are developing, they're priming these neural pathways in their body, this feedback loop, and they're telling their body, hey, I need this neural pathway. I need this. This is also, I should point out, this is another major reason why kids who learn Spanish or learn another language earlier have an easier time regaining that when they're older compared to kids that never learn a second language or anything like that. It's the same concept. You've primed a neural pathway early in your in in your younger years. But unfortunately, a lot of us have been ripped off and we were, we were forced to sit eight hours a day at a time in our life when we should not be sitting at all. We should barely be sitting. We should be running around and using our butt cheeks. Then, once you've been ripped off and, and the development that you probably should have gotten in high school uh, is done, you go to college and you sit some more and then you get a job, you get an internship. Maybe you're somebody like me, you're like a video editor or whatever like that. I mean, I spent 10 years working in retail, so I got to stand a lot, which in that respect is actually a positive. But you're, you're continuing this feedback loop. You're continuing this feedback loop of you telling your body that you're a sitter. You're not a runner. You're not a swimmer. You are a sitter. This is what you do. And so the feedback loop continues and your body goes, okay, well, we don't need our butt cheeks. Let's eat our ass. Let's eat this ass up. And so that's what it does. It keeps, it keeps diminishing those butt cheeks and it keeps making those hip flexors on the front shorter and tighter and tighter and tighter. So what does this have to do with gravity? Well, not only does this all occur because your body's trying to respond to the stress of gravity, but this is where people start to get serious back pain. This is where people start to get serious knee injuries because they've developed a body that is designed for sitting and not for standing or running. And so what happens is, is that when they go to do those things, they have a dramatically higher chance of injuring themselves, either on a micro level or on a catastrophic level. A micro level would be like, you know, it could be tendonitis or whatever, but really, let's say we're talking about back pain. A lot of it is the continuous stress that you're putting on your lower back. Look, we don't really understand pain. Pain is a really complicated thing. And your back is kind of a different area where the same sensation you might feel on your, on your, the rest of your body feels different on your back. If you have a a back pump, 
Like if you have a bicep pump, it feels great. You're like, hell yeah, my biceps feel huge today. If you have a back pump, it might feel like it's the end of the world. This happened to me all the time. Sometimes I would get such an intense back pump that I thought that I broke my back and I needed to go to the doctor. And then two or three days later, it turned out I was totally fine and my back's actually probably stronger than it used to be. Okay, sorry about the cut there, folks. I, um, I have to cut for a, a, a weird audio issue. Okay, so let's say we're going to talk about standing, right? So you've built this body that has increasingly been designed for uh, sitting, the muscles in your butt cheeks are smaller. The muscles in, uh, or I should say weaker. The muscles in your uh, hip flexors are shorter and tighter than they should be, than they would be if you were running around your whole life. The muscles in your butt cheeks don't fire off the same way they would if you've been running around your whole life because you don't have the, the proper insulation in the nerves going to those butt cheeks. So you've created this feedback loop all around sitting. Let's stick with standing. You go to stand because running, I'd like everybody to run, but let's be honest, most people aren't doing that as much as they should be. And so most people's injuries are going to be from like walking and or standing and essentially stress related injuries over the course of a period of time. And this is by and due. This is why people have these ideas like, man, I can't, you know, my, it, my hips are getting tighter and uh, my hips are not the way that they used to be. A lot of it comes from this negative compounding effect, this feedback loop that is working against them. It's the same thing. The same, the same feedback loop that started in your adolescence and worked through your 20s. It's the same thing. But by the time you get to your 30s, the same feedback loop is compounding against you. So what am I mean? So this is what it physically looks like. So your butt cheeks are weak, and so they're not pushing a big part of their job is pushing your pelvis and pushing your your lower half under you or you could say the opposite you could say your upper half on top of it but it's kind of like your base right if you were to i mean think about this if you're building a tower that for one some stupid reason you decide you're going to build a tower that has legs and there's an arch in between well, that arch part that's connecting the upper part and then the bottom part, that would need to be very strong, right? That would almost be like a second foundation. You would need a foundation where the, the arch touches the ground. And you would have to treat the building area that where the top of the arch is and a building going above that, you would have to treat that like it's another foundation. And that's exactly why you have those giant butt cheeks there. If you look at any other muscles in your body... I mean, those muscles are huge. In fact, uh, uh, they are the biggest muscles in your body, single muscles in your body. A lot of people think legs, but your quadriceps are not one muscle. It's four. That's why they're called quads. Your butt cheeks are just one gigantic muscle that is there to act as that second foundation above your feet. And yours is probably too weak. And I'll tell you this, and before I even continue, the reason why I know yours is probably too weak is because I've got a big, strong butt, and mine is still too weak. I'm constantly running into issues because of my butt cheeks being too weak. And I work on mine, and I've been working on mine for half a decade, if not longer. And my butt cheeks are still too weak. So if my butt cheeks are still too weak, I can pretty much guarantee you your butt cheeks are still too weak. So you've got this structure for fighting gravity. And when you go to stand up, your butt sticks out to the, you pushes back. And if you, if you, if you, if you stand up and do this, just exaggerate, stick your butt out. Just, you can do it right now. I mean, unless you're driving or anything like that, please don't do this. But if you're in a position to, to experiment with me right now, try it right now. Try sticking your butt out. What do you immediately feel? Do you feel the weight going into your lower back? If you don't, you've got a different body than most of us. Because there's really only a few places that you can transfer the force of gravity to. And that's your lower back and your quads. You're going to, the upper, those muscles in the front of your upper leg there. You're going to feel that in your lower back. Those are called your erectors. There's a couple other muscles there, your, your QLs or whatever, but we're going to focus on, on your erectors. That's because that is where the force of gravity is going to naturally transfer to. Let's just think about, let's go back to the building analogy. Forget the arch this time, though. Imagine you decided you wanted to build a, uh, con a concave-looking tower. 
In other words, it's almost like a, it's like a sideways V. Imagine it, it juts out diagonally to the left and it connects to another that juts up diagonally to the right. So literally a V turn on its side. Where would the force of, of gravity, or where would the stress of gravity be transferred to? Well, you'd have some on the base, but that joint where those two are connected, that's going to be taking all the weight of everything on top of it. So in your body, you've got these two little muscles on the sides of your spine, your erectors, and they go all the way up and down, but they're kind of like the quads, like I said. They're not one muscle. They're, they're a whole group of little muscles going all the way up and down your spine. And they are so, so much smaller than your butt cheeks. Even if you have shitty, if, if you're one of those people that genetically, like I'm genetically somebody that had just grew up with bigger butt cheeks, even if you have, if you're genetically somebody with a quote unquote flat ass, which is not a real thing, by the way, there's nobody genetically supposed to have a flat ass. You're just not working out your butt or working it out properly. But if you have a smaller butt, your butt cheeks are probably still one of the biggest, if not the biggest muscle in your body especially in comparison to those tiny little erectors in your back. So think about all the weight above your hips. Think about your torso, your arms, your, your head. All that weight, rather than transferring it to your huge butt cheeks, you're transferring that into those little erectors in your back. This is most likely one of the biggest causes of back pain. Again, we don't fully understand pain. Pain is a confusing thing. And one of the things that can happen with pain is that it could just be that a muscle is exhausted. Tendinitis and a lot of these stress-related issues are typically marked when the rate of damage exceeds the rate of repair. And if you're forcing all of the stress of gravity to go into those tiny little muscles that are not designed to do it, and they're, and they're the only muscles that are carrying or doing most of the heavy lifting of your upper body, those muscles are getting super taxed and they just keep getting taxed and taxed and taxed and you're not giving them a break until you go to sit down. Okay. Another thing that can happen. There's basically, this is like an anatomy of, of an explosion, right? There's a bunch of different ways that all of this sitting fucks your back up and makes having weak, shitty butt cheeks fucks your back up and, and basically ruins you. It ruins your health span, ruins your ability to run around. Because your hip flexors are getting tighter, those muscles on the front, remember, they literally are quote-unquote hip flexors, but, you know, the hip flexor is like one of the weirdest muscles in the entire body. It's literally connected to your spine. It is a part of your spine, and it's also part of your hip and basically your leg. It is your spine connected to your leg. It's a really, really weird muscle. One of the different ways that people can get a tremendous amount of back pain is the sitting position is essentially causing those muscles to get exhausted. But more specifically, one of the things that can happen, one of the things that happened to me, one of the many different things that happened to me and my, my back pain, is that because they are shorter, they're very easy to traumatize. They're very easy to stretch out and, and give them little micro traumas or give them catastrophic traumas. So what do I mean by that? So in the case of, let's say, your hip flexor being too tight, and there's a bunch of different muscles in that region that kind of uh, work in a similar fashion, but a, a really big one would be your hip flexors. If they get too short and you lunge, for example, or you take a stride or you trip, right? Let's just say you're somebody that doesn't do any kind of activity at all. You're not playing sports. You trip on a crack and it forces your foot to get hyperextended. Or, well, not what hyperextended relative to that tiny little muscle and you get a little trauma or you get a big trauma, right? So in other words, that short muscle that connects your spine to your femur, your knee gets pulled back too far behind you and it, and it causes some little tears in there. Well, now you've got a very similar situation. Maybe you've got microtrauma, maybe you've got catastrophic trauma, maybe you have scar tissue in there, maybe you have broken collagen fibers. There's a bunch of different things that can, can happen. It, again, it's an anatomy of, of an explosion. It, we're talking about a lot, a lot, a lot of different things that can happen, and it would be almost impossible to point out what happens in, a, in an individual. But now you've got this muscle connected to your back that is damaged. 
And because you're sitting all the time, you're passively using it. And again, rate of repair, rate of damage. So the rate of damage is exceeding the rate of repair, and now you're, you're screwed, right? And we're just talking about back pain right now. I haven't gotten into knee pain yet. Because knee pain, so, I mean, before, before I got too ahead, ahead of myself, I mean, I should tell you, your glutes, let's just say the whole thing, your hamstring, your glutes, and your erectors, they are what are responsible for extending your body, extending your hips. Okay, so in other words, you're using muscles to pick your knees up towards your chest, and you need muscles to pull your knees back, right? Pull your knees behind your, your butt and all of that. Okay. That whole kinetic chain, your hamstrings and your butt cheeks and your erectors, that having weakness in those muscles is responsible for five of the top 10 most common injuries. And these are not necessarily sport injuries, I want to point out. Oh my Lord. Sorry, folks. This pop filter I have, I got to get a new pop filter. If you don't know, a pop filter is basically, well, it's this. It's what prevents that sound from like breaking my my microphone and my pop filter fucking sucks. In fact, I think I'm going to just try to not make any popping sounds. We'll see how this goes. Yeah, my pop filter sucks. So you you uh this kinetic chain between your your hamstrings uh going to your butt cheeks and going up to your uh your erectors when those muscles are weaker than the opposing muscles, they can play a major role in uh, all of the biggest injuries, patellar injuries, meniscus injuries, Oh, if, especially if you're including the side booty, your glute medius, your, your side butt cheeks. Uh, meniscus, ACL tears, uh, back, uh, tons of different back-related injuries, okay? Of, of the top 10 most common injuries, and these, again, not necessarily sports-related. Most common injuries all around. Everybody knows people that never really played sports but has a meniscus tear or a meniscus injury, that type of thing. Five of the top ten are related to those three muscles, your hamstrings, your glutes, and your erectors, but mostly your glutes and your hamstrings. Your knees... There's nothing in the human body that is simple. But your knees are kind of like your, your elbows, right? So they are, you know, the, you can curl them. They go basically, they kind of just go forwards and backwards, right? So when you have a knee-related issue, it is oftentimes very common that it is not related to the knee at all. Instead, it is the other muscles that essentially decide where that knee goes. Because the knee isn't the thing that's deciding where the knee is. The knee basically bends and it extends, it's, it's still an extremely complicated muscle. I mean, I should say an extremely complicated uh, joint. But it isn't the deciding factor. Your knee bends and it extends. In terms of, is it rotated inwards? Is it rotated outwards? Is it, is it uh, well, basically, is it abducted? Which, again, this is where things kind of get confusing for people. But basically, is it, is it pulled away from your other leg? Is it closer to your, to your uh, other leg, right? That is dictated by other muscles, specifically like your hips or your side booty. So one of the things that can happen is when you are sitting, not only are you not using your gluteus maximus, the big part of your butt cheeks, but you're not using the side booty, your glute medius, okay? That side booty part is what controls a, major, a couple different aspects about where you balance the weight on your knee. Are you balancing the weight evenly on both sides? Are you balancing it too much on the inside? If you're playing sports, it's very important for when you make like a quote-unquote lateral cut. So if you are playing tennis, for example, and you want to uh, stop and turn, one of the different ways that people can get knee injuries is because they don't have the strength to be able to control that stop properly. And maybe they put shearing force on it or they put uh, you know, a, a ton of stress over it over a long period of time. But the point is, is that their side booty isn't strong enough to be able to regulate where that knee is. Your hamstrings are, are hamstring to quad, basically back of your upper leg to front of your upper leg, are believed to be possibly the number one uh, cause of 
uh, ACL tears. Specifically, what I should say is the strength ratio of your hamstrings to your quads is believed to be the number one cause of ACL tears. Probably is more complicated than that, but that's, I mean, you should really, you need to understand though, essentially that that whole region, starting with your hamstrings, your butt cheeks, and your glutes play a major part in deciding where does your knee go? How much force is getting pushed into your knee when you stop, when you start? So, the, again, we're talking about feedback loops here. You've created this body by no will of your own that a, via a series of billions of little feedback loops is designed uh, for, for sitting. And everything I've described so far more or less goes into what is called anterior pelvic tilt. I hope to God you have heard of anterior pelvic tilt on YouTube. If you search anterior pelvic tilt, you will find all kinds of videos. Thank God. Anterior pelvic tilt is, is an epidemic in America. Epidemic doesn't have the same meaning <laughs> these days that it does. Back before COVID, you could just say epidemic and people are like, oh my God. Now it's like, oh, well, fuck that. We've had global pandemics, so I don't care about an epidemic. But epidemics are still a problem. And America has an anterior pelvic tilt pan uh, epidemic. What does that mean? Really, it just means that your butt sticks out, right? So basically, anterior pelvic tilt would be the industry jargon. It's like the technical, intimidating word for just your butt cheeks are sticking out. That, that butt cheek pose that you see a lot of girls doing is, is that. I should actually point something out here. This is going to be a little bit of a fun and exciting uh, tangent. Uh, but a lot of that is actually because of what's called uh, lordosis of the spine, or, or specifically female mammalian lordosis of the spine. You guys want to hear me get nerdy? You guys want to hear me get nerdy in like kind of a sexual way? Because guess what? That's what's about to happen. You might need to close uh, your children's ears. Close them like a door. Close the children's ears. Um, Googling something here real quick. Because of a little funny little thing. Because I don't have a Jamie like Joe Rogan does. Lordosis behavior. Okay. Lordosis is when the, your lower back arches and your butt sticks out. One of the reasons why you see so many women do this, well, not so many women, all women do this, because all female mammals do this. It's, it's literally called lordosis behavior. It's essentially the real reason why women stick their butts out. It's, just, it's the reason why women wear heels. A lot of people think that sticking your butt out is about your butt, and that is a big part of it. But why does it look cute when girls who don't have big butts stick their butt out? Why does it look cute when girls wear heels? It's because it forces this lordosis of the, of the spine. All mammals, all female mammals do this. And it's because it is essentially, it's, it's what uh, females do when they are aroused. Long term, it's bad. Long term, you don't want to do this. But as a funny side note, I mean, I'm telling... All of them. We're talking naked mole rats do this. When I, the reason why I was Googling this is because uh, last time I checked Wiki, the, the picture that they had was literally just a naked mole rat performing lordosis, uh, lordosis behavior, which is probably the best way to desexualize a sexual conversation is to start thinking about naked mole rats. So kudos to them. They don't have that anymore. Now they have lions fucking and cats fucking and uh, elephants fucking. Good for them. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, literally, it, it is a behavior that uh, all female ma uh, mammals perform. I think even dolphins do it, which is fucking crazy to think about. Um, naturally occurring positive for sexual reproductivity for copulation presents in most, most mammals, I should say, including rodents, elephants, and cats, and, uh, and humans. The primary characteristics of the behavior are lowering the forelimbs, but with the rear limbs extended and hips raised. Ventral arch... <laughs> ventral... <laughs> Yeah, I told you, folks, I'm talking nerdy here. Ventral arching of the spine and a raising or sideward displacement of the tail. Lordosis, uh, the, during lordosis, the spine curves dorsal ventrally so that, the, so that its apex points towards the abdomen. Basically, it's when girls stick their butts out. So if you've ever wondered, well, you probably never did, but basically what I'm saying is there's a bigger reason why so many women stick their butts out in photos or doing heels. And it's because 
It is a, an innate instinct that exists well beyond our species. It exists in all kinds of different uh, mammalian animals. And it's essentially an instinct that female mammals uh, have to uh, show sexual availability. And so, therefore, obviously, males that are looking to breed, they see that when, it, when a female is performing lordosis behavior, bending of that lower back and arching their, arching in the case of like cats or whatever, but basically sticking their butt up and things like that. It shows that I'm sexually available right now. And of course, it makes all the men horny and go, oh, shit, that that female is ready to go right now. I got to be ready to go right now. And so this is why heels, this is why sticking your butt out is ma makes men uh, go crazy is because it's just it's literally just the animal kingdom. It's just a basic instinct. So hopefully that was a fun little uh, tangent for you. But back to our regularly scheduled programming. So, yeah, basically sticking your butt out is bad <laughs> for a long term. Females do it, obviously, for a short period of time, but it's not the optimal way of fighting gravity. So this when you have um, interior pelvic tilt, it basically means that you, via f billions of feedback loops, you've created a condition where your body just chronically sticks your butt out. And it is believed to be that 85 percent of Americans have anterior pelvic tilt. One of the things that's interesting about that is, is that you may have anterior, pel uh, anterior pelvic tilt and not experience pain. The reason for that is because nobody knows. We don't know what, how pain works. We don't know how it works. That doesn't make it good or bad. That doesn't make it something that you shouldn't tackle. I mean, again, you are trying to fight gravity. So you should build a body that can fight gravity the best that you can for as long as you can. And having a compromising position like sticking your butt out puts the weight of gravity into your lower back. There could be all kinds of reasons why sometimes people have uh, anterior pelvic tilt and don't feel pain. It could be that they uh, had pain, but their body basically kind of turned off the pain receptors because you have to, because you have to get back to life and focus on the things that you do. It could be that there is greater pain somewhere else in the body that is distracting them from that pain. It could be that they're really light. It could be that if, you're, if you are a 300-pound person and you're putting all the weight into your lower back, that that's a lot more shearing force and a lot more, more weight that you're putting into your lower back than somebody who's a mere 100 pounds. It could be that you are treating your, your back like shit and you just really haven't felt the consequences yet. It could be that the compounding effect, because you're lighter or because of your lifestyle, is going to take longer. But remember... Gravity is undefeated. Gravity can beat light, so it will beat you. And the only thing you can do is use proper technique when fighting gravity for the best, for, the lo for as long as you can, right? Because that's essentially what I'm saying is if nothing else beats you, if dementia doesn't beat you, if cancer doesn't beat you, if nothing else beats you, at the end of the day, gravity is going to beat you. So you've got to, I mean, essentially, I define posture as uh, fighting gravity, uh, proper technique for fighting gravity in a, in a long-term condition, right? So over the course of your life. And so these women, these thoughts, going back to these big booty chicks, the funny thing about them is they're fighting the compound effect. They're fighting this negative compound effect of gravity. And ironically, it's hard to see because they t post these photos with them sticking their butt out. But what sometimes what you will see, unfortunately, some of these women will always keep that position. There's lots of women that, because of the way they are doing these exercises, they sort of keep the anterior pelvic tilt position. They keep that sticking their butt out. Or maybe because uh, they're wearing heels, right? Like I said, lordosis of the spine. Or maybe because they just like sticking their butt out for their whole life. They put themselves in this compromising position. However, a lot of women will post these photos. A lot of these big booty girls will post these photos that say flexed, not flexed. Hopefully you've seen them. A lot of them are supposed to be like a dose of reality, right? A lot of these women are saying, hey, like, um, I don't look like this all the time. This is what I look like in a, in a relaxed position. Usually these women look gorgeous either way. So I don't know. For me, I never really get it. But it's supposed to be some type of body positivity thing. And what you will typically see with these women, especially if they're showing their butt, in the flex versus non-flex position, what they're doing is in the flex position, they're sticking their butt out, lordosis of the spine. 
in the non-flexed photo, where it's just supposed to be them being sloppy, but in reality, they're still gorgeous, you'll typically see they have good posture. And that's sort of the frustrating thing about having a big, strong butt, is that when you have a big, strong butt, it makes your butt look smaller because you're pushing your butt in. You're not sticking your butt out. You're, pushing, you're sticking your butt cheeks in. So these women do all of these butt workouts, and a lot of them, for a lot of them, it works. And when it works, I mean, I'm not talking about obviously making them look better or whatever. I'm talking about it works for their posture. It works for their ability to fight gravity. And so they have this posture that is, I guess, less flattering in the sense that it makes their butt look smaller. But that's when you see those photos, when you see those photos of the women saying flex versus non-flexed, the, you will see that in the, oftentimes in the non-flexed photo, their butt will be under them. Their hips will be under them. They won't have that, that shitty posture that puts all of the weight into your lower back. Those women that you see that you might be making fun of or that, that people are making means of, and again, if it's for personal reasons or whatever, but in terms of the exercises they're doing, they are fighting gravity in the best way that they can right now against modern living. The feedback loop that modern living has caused us has compromised our ability to properly fight gravity. And in order to get back on track and to get these neural pathways, this feedback loop that I talked about earlier, is you have to tell your body that you need your butt. You need your butt to get, to get your hips under you. You need your butt to stop transferring gravity into your lower back. You need your butt to help you regulate where you balance the weight uh, in your in your knees, you need your butt cheeks, and you need your butt cheeks to be hard and big and strong. So what what should you be doing? Well, first of all, basically everything you see those girls doing. You know, I said this in the blog, and, and I really mean this. If you put a gun to my head and said, "There's only one group of muscles you're allowed to work out with for the rest of your life," I would do butt workouts. I would do booty cheek and hip workouts. That would be it. I would never do chest. I would never do shoulders. I would never do calf races. If it was just for whatever random reason somebody said, hey, pick one region to work out with for the rest of your life, it would be my butt cheeks and my hips. It would be all the, all the shit that those girls are doing to make them look better in their leggings. That is what I would do. And that's exactly what you should do too if you're in that position. Because that is one of the biggest stressors that you are facing in your life. Again, like I said, gravity is undefeated. And this is how, th that is the optimum way of fighting gravity. There's other issues that can arise from gravity, like in your shoulders and whatnot. But your shoulders are not taking the same kind of load that your lower back is. It's not taking half of your body. It's not taking the weight of your torso and your head. All that weight is supposed to be going into your butt cheeks. So what are we talking about? What are the exercises the girls are, are doing? Well, I mean, if you really want to get down to it, you could just watch Glute Lab. You can just watch Brett Contreras. Brett Contreras is essentially like, a god amongst men. He's a guy who essentially, I, from my, what I understand, he pretty much has his PhD in butt cheeks. He has a franchise a, of different, they're called glute labs, of gyms dedicated only to butt cheeks. I mean, I'm sure people do like uh, overhead presses or whatever, but the whole gym is, they're called glute lab. It's all about growing your butt cheeks. And it's filled with gorgeous women, and they're all taking photos of their ass and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, again, this is what you should be doing. One of the things that's funny for me is, kind of going on a side tangent again, is I do a lot of hip thrusts, which is a huge part of what I recommend uh, for having weak butt cheeks. And, and if you need better butt cheeks, start doing hip thrusts today. One of the things I find so strange about doing uh, hip thrusts for me is I feel like two things happen, and I, and I need feedback on this. I want to hear what other, people, other people's experiences are about this. Two things happen when I do hip thrusts. One is I feel like all the women in the gym are watching me. And I can't tell if it's some kind of sexual thing or if they're just not used to seeing men doing hip thrusts. But I don't know. I feel like women are checking me out. When I, I don't feel like I have that any other, if I'm doing squats, if I'm doing bench. I, I, there is no other exercise that I do where I feel like all the women are turning their heads. It's literally just hip thrusts. I don't know if that's just me. If you're a if a guy, if you're a dude doing that, please leave me a comment either on on Anchor, Spotify, YouTube. I don't know, message me on Instagram. Let me know is has this been your experience? Do you feel like women are turning their heads? Women, 
do you do you feel compelled to look at men when they're doing hip thrusts? Is there something, I don't know, weird about it? Is there something sexual about it? What is it? Is there something going on that makes you go, oh, I have to look at, you can't stop looking at a guy doing hip thrusts. Maybe I'm crazy, but I, again, <laughs> I, you know, I look around when I'm doing pull-ups, when I'm doing anything else, I never see women checking me out. I never feel like I'm being, like women are checking me out. It's literally just hip thrusts that I feel like all heads are turning and women are checking me out. Vice versa, another thing happens is when I do hip thrusts, I feel like guys are physically laughing at me. It, there's nothing, there's nothing else that I feel like this happens for. Again, I do squats, I take a break, I look around, I don't feel like guys are laughing at me. I don't feel like guys are looking at me, if guys are not shaking their head and smiling like a bunch of fucking idiots. None of that, okay? But I feel like, maybe I'm crazy, when I'm doing hip thrusts, I look around and men are laughing at me. And it's the fucking stupidest thing. One, because if it's true that women are checking me out, then I would think most guys would want to start doing that. If most, if I, if it is true, and and I'm not delusional, if it is true that women are checking me out because I'm doing hip thrusts for some type of, I don't know, it's just attractive. It's just an attractive thing for men to do, because of the <laughs> the thrusting motion or whatever. Who knows? Uh, if 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 it's something that makes women aroused, then jokes on you, asshole. You should be doing them. I and mean, that's just for like a sexual reason. I, obviously, for your health span, this is the whole point of this is about your health span and being comfortable in your body. I'm going to just say this right now. And this is kind of extreme. I don't really care. There's too many people. If if you if you have ever laughed at somebody, if you've ever laughed at a man for doing hip thrusts, please don't have kids. Don't do the world a favor. Don't have kids. We don't need more people like you. We don't need more people with back pain. And like they can't figure out why, even though the whole world is telling them you should probably do glutes and work on your glutes or whatever. Fucking don't. The, the thing about hip thrusts that blows my mind is hip thrusts are one of the two exercises that I think have the absolute greatest translation for every sport, uh, pretty much in the world, other than maybe swimming or like rock climbing or anything like that. It's the most translation you can get. Those two workouts are single leg Romanian deadlifts, which is another big booty girl workout, and single leg hip thrusts. Weighted or not. Single leg because, first things first, any unilateral movement is going to have more athletic uh, transfer. It's going to have more relation to any sport, even though it's less usually going to be less weight. It's going to force you to work on your core. It's going to work on your stability, balance. Unilateral workouts are king when you're trying to improve your athleticism. The other big reason why is because most interior pelvic tilt, again, that condition where your butt sticks out, starts because one butt cheek is weaker than the other. One butt cheek, just like anything else, nothing, nothing in the body, it's organic, right? They're not going to wear down evenly. One butt cheek just gets a little bit less communication from your brain, and so your body goes, hey, let's eat that butt cheek first, right? So one butt cheek is a little bit weaker than the other, and so instead of walking in circles, your body holds the other butt cheek back a little bit, okay? So typically, if you want to get that butt cheek to catch up, you're going to have to isolate it. You're going to have to do Romanian deadlifts, single leg Romanian deadlifts, or you're going to have to do single leg hip thrusts. I think Romanian deadlifts are king when it comes to transferring, single leg Romanian deadlifts are tr king when it comes to trans translating to anything. Because going back to the knee and side booty, a huge part of single leg Romanian deadlifts are that you have to use that side booty muscle, your glute medius, to regulate uh, where your knee is. And actually, of course, incidentally, you have to use your uh, groin muscles to regulate where it goes on the inside as well. This is kind of, I'm taking a quote from Athlean X, Jeff Cavalier. But yeah, I mean, try to find any, any exercise you do, try to find a variation that you can do with your feet on the ground, especially if you want to be an athlete. And I would say the difference between an athlete, the reason why we know how now we have good ideas of how now to, to prepare for a health span is because of athletes. What athletes are doing is they are shortening that compound effect. Okay, you are experiencing the compound effect of gravity over the course of decades and decades and decades. And if you're not running as fast as you can and stopping as fast as you can, if you're not putting 800 pounds on your back, if you're not doing these crazy things that you see athletes doing, ramping off of 20-foot off of ramps, and just eating shit on a skateboard or on a, on a snowboard, if you're not doing any of those things, you're experiencing what they're experiencing just over the course of decades. 
So because of people taking this very condensed experience against fighting gravity, we can, we can start to kind of uh, extrapolate what will happen to you over the course of your lifetime. So what is good for, it's what, what's good for the geese is good for the gander, right? What's good for an athlete is good for you. It just takes longer. You're probably going to experience the same stresses and the same injuries. It's just going to take decades rather than a very short period of time. If you want to be, a, if you want to be an athlete, right, you should train with your feet on the ground. There's a lot of different advantages that, and I'm going to get into to training with your feet on the ground in a different episode or I don't know, whatever. But I, I couldn't agree more. The more you train with your feet on the ground, the more athletic you're going to be. When you start doing Romanian, single leg Romanian deadlifts, you are going to have, you're going to be forced to balance because it's asymmetrical. It's asymmetrical weight. You're going to be forced to balance. Uh, you're going to be forced to learn the balance of your foot. And you're going to strengthen a lot of muscles uh, about, you know, to, to balance the weight in your foot. You're going to develop a lot of muscles in your feet, in your ankles, in your calves, um, in your, in your uh, tibialis. You're going to need a lot of uh, co strength and coordination for balancing your knee forwards, inwards, and, and out towards the other knee. And, of course, because it's, it's Romanian deadlift, that is hip extension. That means that you are pushing your knee away from your chest. So flexion means bringing your knee to your chest, and extension means push, pushing your knee away from your chest. And I would say that when I, what I like to do when I do my Romanian deadlifts, I do them very slow, eccentrically, just like I talked about in the last uh, podcast. I imagine that I am in slow motion in the sprinting position because that's basically what you're doing. If you're doing a single leg Romanian deadlift, you are putting yourself in a very similar position to that out the gate sprint. And obviously that has tons of translation to sports. You're going to sprint in most sports. Again, not rock climbing, not um, swimming, but hell, even, even mountain biking, right? You need to be able to, to athletically track where your knees are. You need to be able to balance the force properly in where your knees are. Is it going to be on the inside? Is it going to be in the outside? How can you keep that nice, even, controlled balance of where you're putting the force? Is it forwards? Is it backwards? Is it in the front of your knee? Is it in the back of your knee? Okay, you need to be able to, to athletically control where you're distributing the force of gravity. And again, what's good for the geese is good for the gander. So if this is going to make you more athletic, if it's going to help uh, bulletproof your knees and bulletproof your back, then this is what you need for your health span for your whole life. So butt workouts that you need to be doing. Hip thrusts, weighted hip thrusts. Hey, hip thrusts, again, weight, uh, invented. Weighted hip thrusts, I should say, invented by... The man I just recommended earlier, Brett Contreras. Just look up Glute Lab on YouTube. The man knows more about butt cheeks than probably anybody that will ever live because he specializes in butt cheeks. Um, yeah, look up his videos. But, I mean, I'll just tell you right now. You should be doing everything you see those girls doing. All of them. You should be doing kettlebell swings. You should be doing Stairmaster. You should be doing lunges. You should be doing hip thrusts, single leg deadlifts, deficit deadlifts, regular deadlifts, squats, squat with glute loops on your bands to develop those glute medias. Everything you see those girls doing, all the stuff that you thought might have been silly because they're just obsessed with making their butt bigger, that's what you should be doing. And how much should you be doing them? Well, I'll tell you what I do. I work out my butt every single day. That sounds weirder than it is. I work out my butt cheeks every single day. I don't go that hard, although I will say I think I kind of could because butt cheeks seem to be able to recover very quickly. And my body tends to recover pretty quickly as well, just in general. But I at least try to activate my butt cheeks every day. Why? Feedback loops. All organic processes are a series of feedback loops. Everything in your body is a series of feedback loops. Every day I remind my nervous system that my butt cheeks are there and I need them. Every day. Every day I do single leg uh I do single leg deadlifts. I do I do squats with a with a either at the gym or with a slant board with glute loops around. I do kettlebell swings. I do lunges. I do something every day 
to tell my nervous system, hey, just keep in touch with my butt cheeks. Make sure they're there. Why? Because it's really difficult to maintain that activation. One of the funny things about butt cheeks is that the development of connecting with your butt cheeks is a journey. This is going to sound kind of weird, but it is a journey. Again, you're talking to somebody who was very genetically gifted in terms of, I was just born with big muscular butt cheeks, but I wasn't, they weren't working. When I would squat, when I would deadlift, I would put all the weight into my quads. I'd put it in my lower back. And this is a huge part of the reason why I had a herniated disc in high school. It didn't matter that I had a lot of muscle tissue there. I genuinely, my, I mean, there was, it was like earth, earth to butt cheeks. They couldn't communicate with them. And it's, I'm telling you, it is night and day. When you feel, if you're, if you're one, if you're like me, where, you know, you basically had butt cheeks that were just turned off. There's no telegram. There's nothing. There's no communication, no phone home to those butt cheeks. And you go to do squats or whatever. If you have that breakthrough moment, Maybe you do hip thrusts, which is what I, what I did for a long time. I would do hip thrusts right before my squats. I would do hip thrusts right before I did my, my deadlifts. I would do something that focused exclusively on my butt cheeks, and then I would go to do deadlifts. And when you have that experience, you know what I'm talking about. Because truth be told, if you haven't actually conscientiously made an effort to try and communicate with your butt cheeks, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. You probably squat and you do whatever, and you think, did I do it? Do my butt cheeks turn on? Do I have hip drive? Is it working? If you're asking that question, it's kind of like it's kind of like when people start smoking weed, they're like, am I high? If you have to ask, you're not. You're just not. Okay. If if you have to ask if your butt cheeks are turning on, they're not. Okay. When you have that experience where you do hip thrusts, and and, and mind you, I should point out, a lot of times some people's a neurological pathways with their butt cheeks are so weak that when they go to do uh, hip thrust, even then they're still kicking their quads in. Even then they're still not using their butt cheeks. Even then they're still using their erectors. That was me. That was me for a long time. Helpful tip for that, by the way, is to put glute loops around your knees because the muscles work in sequence. The side booty has to turn on before the big booty, the, the gluteus maximus. This is because, and you can do this experiment if you want to with me, you can turn your feet in, turn your knees in, and try and push your butt under you. You, you basically can't do it. You can't with your knees and internally rotated like that. You can't get your butt under you. You are forced into that anterior pelvic tilt position. You're, you're forced to push your butt out. If you turn your feet outwards, if you externally turn it, uh, rotate your, your knees, you can easily get your butt cheeks under you. You can easily squeeze those butt cheeks together and get your pelvis under you. If you put glute loops around your knees when you're doing hip thrusts, you're forcing that side booty, those glute meatuses, to turn on first, and then you can have plenty of room for those butt cheeks to squeeze in under you. And it should look, again, the goal is, as weird as it sounds, you want to have a bigger, stronger butt, but the bigger and stronger your butt is, the more active your butt is, the smaller it's going to look. Because when you squeeze those butt cheeks in and you push them under, it makes your butt look smaller. It makes it look less flattering. But fuck it. That's, I mean, which do you care about? Do you care about looking good but having back pain? Some people do. I'm not one of those people. But do you care about looking good or do you care about feeling good? I would hope you answered the latter. Right? So... That, I mean, all of these movements, you're going to be squeezing your butt cheeks in and making them look smaller. But yeah, so I mean, everything you see those girls doing, everything you see those girls doing, you should be doing. I Like I said, I gently work them out every single day. A lot of those girls go crazy. A lot of those girls have routines. And the funny thing about them is a lot of these girls are like experts now. A lot of these girls are kind of like that guy, Brett Contreras, where they know so much. I mean, these girls are hip thrusting 500, 600 pounds for 10 reps. A lot of these girls know all the ins and outs of butts. I hope you didn't take that the weird way, but you get the point. A lot of these girls, I mean, I know a little bit about butts. A lot of these women know so much about butts now. I mean, the amount of information, I mean, when you're talking about millions and millions of women focusing on butts and just how can I get a bigger butt? How can I just, can I just get it a little bit bigger? Can I just get a little bit of bigger? Well, guess what? They're going to learn a lot. So take these women seriously. At least from the butt part. If there's other things about them that, you know, whatever, that's up to you. 
But in terms of the butt stuff, take them seriously. A lot of these women have learned a lot, and they have a lot of pointers, and they have a lot of techniques, and they have figured out a lot of shit. And that is why you should roll, clap, please, clap. Think like a thought. That's why you should think like a thought. Because that's what these, these women have figured out a lot. They could be dumb. They could be bimbos. They could be whatever. But God damn it, they have figured out a lot of shit when it comes to butts. And you got to respect them because they are exercising the most practical part of your body, the part of your body that you need. Folks, start working out your butt. Start working out your butt today. Start working out your butt today. It is so important for your health span. It is so important for preventing back pain, knee pain. And I actually, I should, I should also point out, as somebody who had a herniated disc and had a lot of back pain, and hit, I've, had, I've had every injury you can imagine, pretty much. Well, not except for, like, trauma. I've had every stress-related injury you can imagine. Uh, most of these injuries, these random injuries that I've accumulated, started with back pain. And I didn't even realize it until I had to play detective afterwards. You would be shocked at the cascading effect that can occur in your life that starts with just back pain. The, all the negative things that can happen to you that just start with back pain. So, folks, I mean, you would be shocked. I had, I had upper back issues. I had shoulder issues. I had neck issues. I had foot issues. I had knee issues. I had so many different issues that accumulated because of not tackling back pain. And in my particular case... Anterior pelvic tilt was not the only issue, but it is a major portion of the ecosystem of pain that I had developed over the course of a decade because of having a herniated disc. So I could tell you from personal experience, if you do not tackle this, it can work against you so hard and so fast, it can alter your personality. Chronic pain, and, and I have a whole video about this called uh, Flexing and Philosophy. Chronic pain can change you as a person. Chronic pain changes your decision making. It makes you more irrational. It makes you act more like a dick. Chronic pain changes you. And you don't. the worst part is you don't even realize it's happening. Chronic pain can make you a worse person. And this is, I think, a huge part of the reason why I'm so gung-ho about uh, critical fitness and, and trying to get people moving and develop muscles like your butt cheeks and all that is because it changes you in ways that you don't even realize. You can be a shittier person in a lot of different ways. You can, you can lose your emotional stability. You can kind of lose your mind. I mean, I, I talked about this before. I used to have chronic pain. I had back pain so bad. I started feeling weird sensations like I was being electrocuted. I started feeling sensations in my lower back that felt like... I, it's hard to describe, but it felt like pins and needles being stabbed in my back and being like almost like a, sh a shooting taser, like needles sticking in my back, being pumped full of electricity and causing me to convulse and act in weird. And I went home, I was in college. I, I sat down and I tried to like ease the pain and then I wobbled home and I laid in bed and I cried like a fucking bitch because I was in so much agony. Chronic pain can change you. It can alter your life. It can ruin you. It can, it can put you into depression. I mean, this is a negative compounding effect and it... it it starts small, but just like any compounding effect, like credit card debt or anything like that, it, it can start small and it can work and work its way and eat and eat and it can consume you. It can consume your whole fucking life. So start now. Start the positive compounding effect now. Start working out your butt cheeks. Start doing hip thrusts. Stop laughing at men for doing hip thrusts and start doing hip thrusts. Folks, think like a thought. Please have bigger and stronger butt cheeks for your own sake, for the sake of your country. Please work on your butt cheeks. This is Critical Fitness. This is an apparel brand. If you like this, if you found this information useful, if you found this entertaining, if you liked hearing me talk about butt cheeks, if you liked hearing me talking about women arching their backs to show that they're sexually aroused, if you liked any of this, you liked it. If you like my designs, go to my website, projectcriticalfitness.com. Leave a comment if you're watching this on YouTube. Leave a comment if you're listening to this on Spotify. If you see this as a, as a, a video on Instagram, fuck it, leave a comment. I don't care. But uh, we got to get this we got to get this engine going. And folks, I'm going to need your feedback. And, and I'm all constructive feedback, welcome. Even look, if it's a mistake, if I made a mistake, if I made a technical error in some of the things that I'm talking about here, which we didn't obviously get too technical, but if there's a technical error, I want to hear it because I love learning. 
Check out my website. Leave a comment. Leave a like. And give me some feedback, folks. And as always, have a great workout.